Evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to the fourth uh, of our In Conversation series uh, from the famous Royal Society of Medicine. I do hope you have a uh, glass of wine handy to, uh, to drink tonight. Uh, we started this idea of uh, In Conversation really dates back to my uh, work experience with Anthony Clare, who ran, many of you will remember, in the psychiatrist chair for many years on the radio, and I thought it was a fantastic program. So in combination with our beloved president, Sir Simon Wesley, we um, interviewed live, or he interviewed live, uh, Stephen Fry, Jed Mercurio, and Ken Loach. And then this little virus came along, changing everything, and uh, we've now had three webinars, Evan Davis, Fergal Keane, and historian Andrew Robert, uh, histor who uh, all of which have done a great job. And coming up, we've got uh, next week, Sir John Scarlett from MI6. And uh, in June, we are very pleased to announce that Michael Palin's agreed to appear. So we, uh, we've got some fantastic guests. But tonight we have uh, the very famous and very wonderful Jane McQuitty, wine correspondent of the Times. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to her, her now, and I'm going to say, Jane, in this age of COVID-19, what is the new normal for you, and what is the new normal for the wine business? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the new normal, and uh, it, it's interesting. Uh, in a way, there is no new normal. So for me i normally at this time of year in certainly in april and may go to four or five tastings a week so all of that's come to a grinding halt i'm lucky if i manage to taste a dozen wines which i've collected from various sources in my kitchen every morning and spit into my kitchen sink my lucky family and uh, you know I, the hospitality industry has been very badly hit by this so What's happened is that the wine merchants who've had a good e-commerce business have, you know, really taken advantage of it. It's almost like all their Christmases have come at once. So in the month of March, uh, beers, wines and spirits uh, via online mail order merchants and e-commerce sold 78% more than they had done previously. So that's a whopping increase. And it's fine if your business is set up for e-commerce and it's fine if you've got a good website. But if you're one of those wine merchants who's not quite so savvy in that department, you're not going to have an easy time of it. And if you're a, a wine merchant who's traditionally sold to restaurants, pubs and clubs, you know, in other words, the on trade rather than the off trade, which is supermarkets and wine merchant shops, you know, you, you're, you're in trouble because all of those have closed you don't know when they're going to open again. You've bought a lot of wine and you've got nowhere to put it. So some of these restaurants are beginning to sell cases direct to the public. The new normal is it's a great big switch for, you know, wine, beer and spirit folk. And, but I object and I don't, I refute the claim that we're all becoming a nation of alcoholics because just because we're bulk buying booze doesn't mean it's like we bulk buy loo paper and hand sanitizer. It doesn't mean to say that, uh, you know, we're all reaching for the bottle. Uh, I think I'm drinking less now in care of uh, this crisis that we're in than I used to. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. I feel quite tired at the end of the day. And I think no, I don't particularly want a glass of wine. People are following that trend more than people would, uh, more than newspaper headlines would have us believe. And so, Jane, what you, you if if there wasn't a COVID crisis, what would you be doing now this time of year? I would be going to four or five tastings a week. I'd be looking at the latest 2019 vintage from France, Spain. Uh, Italy. I'd be going to two or three supermarket tastings a week. I'd be going to a lot of wine merchant tastings. I'd be going to a lot of generic tastings. So I taste around in normal circumstances. I taste around 10,000 wines a year. So I'd be, you know, tasting and spitting, I hasten to add, hundreds of wines. And at the moment I'm tasting, you know, at the end of a week, you know, a few dozen and that's it. So it's going to have quite a big impact on the Times Top 100 Wines of Summer because I'm going to have to think of another way of, you know, 
getting a good range of wines at a good range of prices from a good range of countries. It's going to be quite hard to put that together, but I'm going to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, ahead of this interview, I talked to David Gleave from Liberty Wine, his brother uh, is a urologist in Vancouver. That's how I know him. And um, I was asking him about uh, his jo uh, jo wine distribution across London to restaurants here. What, what do you think will happen to restaurants when uh, after lockdown, when the, uh, uh, the, the situation stabilized a little? Yeah. Well, David Lee from Liberties, and I've also been in touch with him, is a slightly better position than some merchants in that he already deals with supermarkets and he already deals with, uh, you know, various, you know, customers direct. And, but he's going to have to be very careful about balancing his cash flow, uh, as indeed will most wine merchants, unless they've got a really savvy e-commerce business where they're generally dealing with, um, with consumers, with the public. So I think as far as restaurants and pubs and clubs are concerned, I think what's going to happen is that most restaurateurs are saying that they think they'll get about 50% of their customers coming back. Uh, I think that's going to be top whack because people will still be frightened of going out. They'll be frightened if they've avoided the COVID-19, they'll be terrified of getting it. And if they've had COVID-19 once, they'll be worried that there is the possibility of them getting again. So I don't think we're going to rush to our favorite restaurants when, as soon as lockdown's over. Um, what about I, wine yeah. production, Jane? Because, you know, social distancing on a vineyard, I mean, what, what, what? Well, social distancing on a vineyard, you know, can work and does work. It ha is working now in Europe in that you can encourage vineyard own, you know, workers to arrive in their own car at a vineyard. You can encourage them to work two rows away from each other. When you get into the winery, you can have already taped the floor and make certain that they're keeping two meters distance. And in the smaller family firms, you know, where the family always works together, that won't be a problem. I think for some of the big cooperatives, uh, that are maybe in complete lockdown at the minute. I think that will be, you know, it, it, the, the supply chain from them may have a few hiccups, but right now because of Brexit and because people stocking up on popular wine styles, that isn't a problem. And in the new world, so in Southern hemisphere countries, COVID-19 arrived in March, April, you know, in the middle of their harvest, well, you know, interrupted their harvest, but most of them cut down their workforce and manage to survive and get through it. The one country that you know is really having difficulty is South Africa because for some curious reason the South African government was very slow to put the green light on the start of the harvest and then finally did allow people to go and uh, vineyard workers to go and pick the grapes and bring them into the wineries. But then, you know, in an unprecedented move, they then said, right, you, we're, we're not going to allow you to export the wine you've made. So as so many people in the Cape survive, you know, as grape growers and wine, you know, and wine producers, you know, that's really a tragedy for South Africa. And I, and I don't see how that's going to come good for them. So, you know, the, the, the knock on effect of COVID-19 and the hospitality industry will certainly change the whole pattern of how we, you know, of how we drink, you know, where we drink and when we drink. Yeah. There's a question come in from uh, Nicola, one of our big supporters, Nicola Stingard. She, she says she loves drinking wine. She's probably got a glass in her hand now and she feels very sorry for those in the trade who are suffering. Should we uh, bulk buy now to help them out? And uh, if so, who should we buy it from, she says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, bulk buying is fine with wines that are going to, you can put away in your wine rack for, um, you know, a few years and there's no going to be a problem. But bulk buying, you know, cheaper, cheerful wines, is, and, unless you're going to hoover through them quickly, it isn't necessarily sensible. So uh, bravo, Nicola, for continuing to drink wine that's great and I think you should read my column every Saturday in the Times uh, getting a quick plug in for myself there and 
but you know, what's your, I don't think we're going to turn into a nation of alcoholics, certainly, but I do think that, and on a Friday night and a Saturday night, if you want to go for it and get plastered, well, why not? The saints among us are few, but I think most of us are, if we want to get up and do a full day's work the next day and, you know, want to make the best of the situation we're in, most of us already are quite careful, um, you know, on, and aware of overindulgence and certainly in my own case I think I'm actually drinking less wine now um, than I do normally so and I think a lot of other people in the UK will be doing the same thing but carry on drinking Nicola keep calm and carry on drinking wine at home that's it the always message used, <laughs> always used to be said that the definition of an alcoholic was somebody who drank more than his doctor did but I think I don't think dr doctors drink as much as they used to not but listen, one of, one of our keen drinkers is Humphrey Scott, big supporter of the RSM, a uh, coloproctologist. Uh, he says, does Jane believe wine should be measured quantitatively as in the Parker Guide, pros and cons? That's All right. So, well, this is a huge sort of topic that people get very, in the wine world, get very steamed up about. So, you know, can you really say a 98 point wine is, is you know, not as good as a 99 point wine, you know? Uh, I'm not certain that you can, I, I kind of rather preferred the sort of star system that Michael Broadbent used to go into when he sort of gave his top wine five stars and four, three, two and one. And certainly I mark wines out of 20, but I don't think I'd necessarily mark them for Times readers because I think that's off putting, attaching a number to something. I think you want to say, you know, you want to use words perhaps to convey your feelings about a wine rather than a number. So I think I disagree with numbers there. <laughs> Let, let's uh, not focus t totally on wine because you've got this very interesting career, haven't you? And very influenced by your father, who's got a very large in entry on Wikipedia that I was reading. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about A, your father, William, and then how he influenced you to get into the, the wine business. Yeah, well, uh, father was a, a polymath, rather extraordinary character in that, you know, was a photographer, a writer, and also a film producer. And his most um, piece of work that people remember more than any other was a film made in 1958 called A Night to Remember. It was a black and white film about the sinking of the Titanic and is still the definitive film to this day because it was made with eyewitness accounts. So people who'd survived the sinking of the Titanic were advisors on the film and father was very determined as was Roy Baker the director to make it as realistic as possible and they used uh, a script um, film script from the book of the man who wrote this definitive account of a night dream called Walter Lord who was a good family friend and I think the thing about my father is that, you know, my mother, I think, found it quite hard living with the world's greatest Irishman. But, you know, what my dad used to say was too many chiefs in Ireland, not enough braves. So, but if you have this conviction, like my father did, that this is what I'm going to do and I'm jolly we're going to get it done, you know, it's quite liberating. And as a child, seeing him do attack all sorts of projects with gusto was very um, liberating in itself. And he... Uh, so I have an elder brother and a younger sister and he drummed into us from a very early age that we had to you know, earn our own livings, do our own thing. And as women in particular, he thought that having children and getting married was a complete waste of time. <laughs> and what was really important was our careers and what we needed to do. And if we absolutely had to have children and a marriage and all that, then we had to do it as a sort of subtext to our life. And if you're brought up like that, it makes you, I found it very empowering. It just means that when, you know, left school and at, at age 18, I thought, great, now I'll do what I want to do because I'd had such a good example with him. And my mother too, I should hasten to add, because she was an economist, worked at, um, was at LSE, got a scholarship to LSE and uh, was vice president of the students' union there. So Bernard Levin was the president. So I think she found that quite, quite hard work. But uh, so it was, a, it was an exciting childhood. Uh, um, I felt very fortunate, very blessed. And then did you, you didn't go straight to the Times. You just no, I, went to, I went to work pretty much to, uh, straight away for Condé Nast. So that was the publishers of Vogue and Brides and House and Garden. So I started work in Vogue House 
and uh, what my dad used to call vogue on the outside and vague on the inside <laughs> because it was a particular era you know in the 80s of that sort of fashion easter bubblehead viewpoint and I must say it was a great apprenticeship for me because I edited something called the wine and food section in House and Garden and that allowed me just to get on with my job quietly without having to get too worked up about what was going on the, on the fashion floor which was a whole new different world <laughs> but it was a very um, it was a good introduction you know when you work for that kind of publication you get a pretty good address book quite quickly and I was very fortunate, you know, I, I landed on my feet there. When did you start at the Times? Uh, well, I'd been seven years at uh, House and Garden and then I went to work for the Consumers Association editing something called the Witch Wine Guide and writing Witch Wine Monthly. And the Times came to me uh, at that time and said, would you like to be our wine critic? And uh, that was rather extraordinary. And so I started for them in the in the 80s, in the early 80s. Because we have a friend in common, dear old Dr. Tom Stutterford, who I think a lot of RSM members will remember most fondly. So tell us a little bit about Dr. Tom. Oh yeah, the amazing Dr. Tom, as he was called by all of his Times colleagues, including me. Uh, he was just a delightful man. And that, you know, whenever you used to ring him up in a panic because one of your children had hatched a dreadful rash or you know or had a temperature or there was some something that wasn't quite right he was always very calming and very measured and he rem he struck me as being one of the last of that old school gentleman uh you know gps uh, physicians practitioners he, he had a good practitioners he had a good holistic way of looking at people so he would uh you know he, he you know, he had a very good understanding of human nature and used that in his uh, his diagnosis and the way he dealt with you. And he was, uh, he, I always enjoyed his company, very knowledgeable. The only thing we disagreed about was ghosts. <laughs> he had this firm conviction that every house he moved into in Norfolk and he um, did up houses and sold them, that was always, you know, bats in his belfry, ghosts. And I say, look, Tom, re really not certain about that, but, you know, if you're, if you're convinced you're going to get a higher price for the house, well, then fine. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question from Professor Parveen Kumar, author of a famous book and president of the uh, Royal Medical Benevolent Fund, does amazing work supporting doctors, very important in this particular time, of course. Parveen says, has being a woman helped or hindered your career in the man's wine world? Mm, that's a good, good question. Uh, I do know, certainly in the early days when you arrived at, you know, Posh Chateau and big, or, or even just sort of big wineries, you'd get out of the car and they'd look at you rather disappointed and they'd go, oh dear, I was expecting Mr. McQuishy. And I used to get, uh, I still do it from time to time, get letters from people in the trade, trade to, dear Mr. McQuishy, I'd like to introduce you to my winery, etc. And I think there are some, it's less now than it was, but I think certainly when I started, there was very much a feeling that, um, you know, this is a, you, you got, they, they would never say, but you always got the feeling that there would be a big sigh of relief when you left the tasting room, because then the boys could all, you know, stop spitting into spittoons, drink a bit too much and tell a few blue jokes. There was very much that kind of feeling in the water. And occasionally it pops up now, which is a, a bit irritating. But I think, uh, I think we've got better at it. But I think it, one of the reasons why wine writing, I think, has attracted slightly, how shall I say this, slightly uh, irritating, <laughs> determined women is because we've sort of realised that it was going to be a challenge to kind of get through it and get at it. And I think it's interesting that it's the same sort of style of personality of, of women who've kind of beavered through and, and made it there. Um, I've got a good question here from Tony Whitehead, who I've known for years and years. Tony says, the advised limit on alcohol consumption has recently been reduced, but the strength of wine has increased, especially from France, where irrigation is forbidden. What do you think uh, is the solution to that conundrum? Yeah, well, I wish the Royal Society, because I can get right up on my little high horse here, would lift the level of what you view as acceptable safe drinking from 14 units a week 
you know, to something, well, back to 21 units for women and 28 for men. Because if you say to people it's 14 units a week, then it makes all of us who drink at least 28 units, if not more, don't forget a bottle of wine is about 10 units, uh, feel that we should rush to AA and, you know, we're curtailing our lives and all the rest of it. It's not, as you well know, um, alcohol and how you metabolize your alcohol is, is dependent on how good your liver is, how many enzymes it's got and how good it is at metabolizing alcohol. And it's to do with all of those genetic factors. And uh, I agree with your um, doctor there because what is true is that in recent years, because of global warming and climate change, what's happening is that we're getting hotter and sunnier vintages. And you get hotter and sunnier vintages, you get more sugar in the grapes, which means you're gonna get more alcohol in the wines. And certainly back when I first started writing about wine, you know, 12, you know, 12, degree, you know, 12 degrees, 11 to 12 degrees for white wine was normal and 13 for reds was normal. Now you quite often come across, you know, 14, 14 and a half bottles of white and 15, 16 degrees of alcohol for reds. And, you know, that's pretty toppy. You, but if the fruit's in balance and the wine is, you know, well made, then, then that's fine but often they aren't. And they're these sort of big alcoholic fruit bombs from places in the new world. And they're, you know, you, you're really difficult to drink a glass, let alone finish a bottle. So, but I think people are aware of this now. And I think winemakers are beginning to, um, you know, pick grapes a bit earlier. They're not looking for the blockbuster style so much. They're going for varieties that, you know, naturally produce less alcohol. So I think I think we're aware of the problems and taking steps to kind of reduce them, Dr. to reduce Tom the alcoholic always, content. Dr. Tom always used to say that a glass of claret had health-giving uh, properties, but uh, I mean, he used to to quaff uh, <laughs> quite a few of them. I think. I think um, that's I think that's the pot calling the kettle black. There, if you don't mind me saying so, Professor Kirby. Every single medical man I, or woman that I know of drinks absolutely like a fish, drinks way more than even journalists do. And for heaven's sake, we're supposed to be big drinkers. So Tom, you know, in all the years I've known him, I never saw him worse for wear. And his viewpoint was the same as my father's, the same as mine, you know, take a little wine for thy stomach, stomach's sake. You know, and the other thing about wine in, in times of trouble, and in terms of spirits and beer in times of trouble. You know, if you're having a grim day, the thought of looking forward to putting your feet up at the end of the day and having a glass and just relaxing, you know, is pretty helpful. And I think, don't forget in times of trouble, I think, you know, we need wine more than ever. Um, and obviously I'm biased, but, uh, you know, I think it's important that you know, if somebody wants to have a blowout on a Friday or a Saturday night, you know, why not? You know, the saints among us are few and, you know, you're not going to do that every night. I think people police themselves as far as that alcohol intake is concerned, um, much better than the medical profession would have us otherwise. In fact, I remember having, I was given a, a free booper test, some, uh, you know, um, a wee while ago, and he asked me how much alcohol I drank and I told him or whatever. And then we had this complete ding dong where, you know, he said that, you know, that was ridiculous and I was drinking way too much and um, the units were 14 and I'm, you know, blah. And I happened to say, well, actually, I knew several of the doctors who were in that Royal Society meeting. And I know that the figure for 14 and 21, which they were originally uh, 14 for women, 21 for men, were, were picked out of the thin air. There was no scientific evidence. And so we ended up having this quite loud argument. So I'm afraid that wasn't my best day. Let's, let's talk a little bit about some of the charity work that you help, uh, help us with. Um, uh, you know, you're a member of the Vintners Company now. I think you're uh, on the council, uh, I believe, of that. And we've had a few dinners in that amazing Vintners Hall. Yes, uh, I think we've got a Royal Charter going back to, I think it's 1364. So we're one of the top 12. So I was made a vintner in 2018. And you're quite right about the Vintners Hall. It's got a very strong, like, uh, you know, all of the 12 livery companies got a very strong charitable um, focus. And 
they give the hall for free. And for many years, I'd done these big charity wine dinners, raising quite some big sums of money at Vintners Hall and just sort of cruising in and doing my wine chat and having, you know, you know, a grand meal. And eventually in 2018, I thought, you know, this is ridiculous. I must start to put something back. You know, it's not, it's not okay for me to use the Vintners beautiful hall and not to give something in return. So I became a vintner and now I'm involved in some of their charitable endeavors. And the other charity I'm very keen to support is the Urology Foundation, Tuff, and I'm a patron of Tuff. And it's to do with what my mother-in-law used to call men's plumbing. So that's uh, the bladder, uh, prostate, you know, all of the unmentionables. And my dad sadly died of prostate cancer. So I've always wanted to put something back there and uh, you know very happy to do whatever Tuff asked me to do and actually Stephen Fry is one of the other patrons so I've just been reading his book which thoroughly well I've um, read Mythos and I'm now embarked on uh, Heroes so very exciting tales of Greek gods and Bacchus is in there so uh, you know it, it's uh, it's important to put something back and the other cancer charity I'm involved in is ICR. So that's the Institute of Cancer Research. And we have our, our big fundraiser every year is Christmas carols at Chelsea and the Royal Hospital Chelsea with those amazing Chelsea pensioners. You've got wonderful stories to tell of the, you know, grim periods of British history that they were in. And uh, it's very humbling when you meet them, uh, both the Chelsea male pensioners and, and there's now Chelsea uh, women pensioners and they're a very sprightly lot you have to kind of watch a step when you go in there because they're uh, you know they're, they're full of life and beings which is exciting to see so I think it is important if you can to put something back and I think when you're in a crisis like this one's forcibly reminded of how fortunate I am doing the job I am you know it's one that I love it's one that I can carry on doing you know, my column appears every week in the Times. And, you know, I'm one of the fortunate few, but my heart goes out to everybody in, um, in our nursing, um, you know, every nurse, uh, you know, every doctor, everybody on the front line. Um, you know, I, I wish I could do more. Um, it's really important to, you know, to carry on with social distancing for as long as we can, you know, that, that is something that is in everybody's power and let's hope that we can uh, continue with that. And um, unlike Mr. Trump, is. who believes that bleach is going to be the solution to the, you know, uh, the problem, I think ingesting wine would probably just do a lot better job and make everybody a lot happier. Certainly it's not going to kill you like bleach, that's for sure. Your charity work has extended to you being auctioned yourself several times, Jane, hasn't it? Uh, yes, yes. So this was uh, a good wheeze and slightly embarrassing when you see your name up on a whiteboard and, you know, nobody wants to vote for you and buy for you. But my husband, who's very kind and tolerant, uh, what he does is he puts a bid in to have dinner with the wife and the wife's um, sommelier service for a year. That tends to get you know, the, the banqueting hall or wherever we are going. And people go, oh yeah, why, why not? Yes, that sounds good. But very um, irritatingly, I never make as much money as the two weeks in some swanky villa in Provence. I'm always the next one down, but um, I usually get sold twice to, you know, once to somebody who's got the winning bid and then to an underbidder. So perhaps I should be grateful for that. <laughs> have you got a favorite purchaser of all the people that uh, have, have uh, bought you in an auction? Uh, yes, I think I have. So this is another uh, tough trustee. She's a wonderful lady called Rosemary McCare, who's now become a good friend. And she was an underbidder in uh, the first time I got auctioned and was a bit rattled and sort of, you know, beetled up to me afterwards and said, oh, you know, I really wanted to win you because I've got a winery in Chile called Kintai. And we then got talking and you know i helped her out as well and although the winery is no longer uh, her concern i managed to get a winemaker and a viticulturalist to come in and turn the quality um you know, just to nudge the quality along a bit but she's become a good good friend so it's quite interesting when you you know 
you get involved in these uh, charitable groups, how you know, good things come back to you as well. Well, we hope you're going to help us a bit with the uh, uh, RSM because, you know, there's a big charity uh, uh, job to be done uh, in, in, in maintaining our work in education and innovation, especially the young doctors who are dressed up in their PPE and uh, are there on the front line dealing with things they never thought they were going to deal with um, when they went into medicine. So um, your, your assistance there, Jane, would be much, uh, much appreciated. No, we're very happy to help in whatever way I can. I mean, my, you know, you know, my heart goes out to them. You, the, you know, the, this is, you know, terrifying work. And the fact that they go in every day and work these grim shifts in grim surroundings with people at death's door and still manage to do their job. It, it, again, it's very humbling and, you know, hats off to all of them. And, and if only we can get the Royal Societies to up the units per week, then, <laughs> then that would you know, make everybody happy. But I think, um, you know, good things sometimes, you know, when one door closes, another opens. So let's not be, you know, let, let's remember that, that there may be some good that comes out of all of this. I don't know quite what it'll be, but let's hope that some good does somewhere. Well, we were hearing on our COVID-19 uh, series yesterday from the uh, CEO of the Nightingale Hospital that he thinks that uh, the NHS has changed forever. Uh, it'll never be the same again. And perhaps it will um, actually in the new world, post-COVID world, it will be a, a little more fleet of foot and, uh, and better organised than it has been in the past. I've got a question from a colleague of mine, Christian Brown. He says... Um, uh, if you were sent to a desert island, Jane, um, which, which bottle of wine or uh, uh, alcoholic beverage would you take with you? Oh, that's a very good question. I, I think I'd take a bottle of champagne and I should actually just fess up. I wrote a book about champagne and sparkling wine, which involved one whole spring and one whole summer of tasting, I think it was something like 3,000 different bottles of champagne and sparkling wine. So vintage, non-vintage, prestige. And at the end of the summer, I was so bereft because I just thought sparkling wine was the greatest thing I'd ever tasted. I had a real full-on passionate love affair with sparkling wine and particularly with champagne. So it would have to be champagne. And I think in these straightened times, I think I'd go for a non-vintage champagne and I think I would choose something like Paul Roger because that was Winston Churchill's favourite champagne. And I would hope that in this you know, troubled era we're in, that the bulldog spirit of Winston Churchill would somehow rub off on me and that I would you know, have a, a bit more of a spring in my step. But hats off to all the medical profession for everybody in the front line. You're just doing an amazing job. Um, you know, I, I really, um, I do hope that the good that comes out of it is that the NHS gets the funding, gets the trust, gets the respect of everybody in government and that we no longer, you know, abuse it, um, that we revere it. That would be, that would be a plus. Well, here, here to that. There was a question a bit earlier actually about um, Prosecco and, and English sparkling <laughs> wine. I've had a few really nice glasses of English sparkling wine. Yeah, the Prosecco is vile, nasty, sticky stuff. It has a third more sugar in it, residual sugar, than champagne does. So most good ordinary champagne will have about 10 grams of residual sugar a litre. But, you know, uh, but some of the drier styles will have less. Uh, but Prosecco has at least 15 grams, if not more. And you know it, it's a low life wine made you know in a in a tank uh you know you're never going to get me to say anything terribly pleasant about prosecco having said that i swallow my you know anti prosecco stance to occasionally recommend a good one um so it's you know that's english sparkling wine uh, english sparkling wine well again what you need for a really good sparkling wine is a thin, mean, high acid wine. And England produces, you know, thin, mean, high acid wines very naturally because we're a cool northern marginal grape growing climate. So we've, we've totally got the right base 
for great English, uh, for a great sparkler. And now that we've got the technical expertise and trained winemakers, we've, um, you know, we are beginning to produce some really elegant sparkling wines. So uh, easily the, you know, the top houses, so people like Nye Timber, people like Campbell Valley, uh, people like Hattingley, who've always been consistently good, you know, their non-vintage wines are really every bit as good as non-vintage champagne. And some of the single vineyard wine, English fizz that's being made now is as good as some of the, uh, you know, prestige and luxury produ products from champagne. So very quickly, well, no, that's, a, that's an exaggeration. You know, we have turned our, the quality of English fizz around. It's made by the same method as champagne, made by the method champenoise, and it's grown in, so in chalky soil on the South Downs, you know, in, in, in you know, Krimeridgian chalk soil. So pretty much the same as champagne. So, so Will Williams, Jane, is saying, um, what, which are the star producers we should be watching out for, for still wines uh, in, in the British wine industry? Any English, English. So British wine is something that's made from grape concentrate that arrives in cans and merely has yeast added to it. And it's fermented on English. So it's English wine, English or Welsh wine. Uh, so he wants good still wine names. Uh, well, 2018 was our best English vintage ever. So there's a huge run of really great English whites and English reds from 2018. So, you know, uh, just check out my columns and it'll <laughs> tell you where they all are. But 2018, still English wine is, is what to go for. And pretty much, uh, you know, all of the good guys made good wines in 2018 because guess what? We had sunshine and we had a lot of sunshine and that's what a cool Northern marginal grape grown climate you know, lacks is sunshine, but not in 2018. We had a great summer. Well, another comment here. Patrick Kerr says, my grandfather Harry was big friends with Billy McQuitty. Oh, yes. 20 years ago. So uh, you know, we're, we're personalising uh, this evening. Jane, I, th I think we're running out of time. About 40 minutes, I, I think, is about the ideal time for these webinars. So I'd, I'd like to say thank you for, uh, for you for amazing uh, chat, uh, walk through your life, your dad's life, and the uh, the wine industry. Uh, and I'm going to probably go uh, and open a bottle of Paul Roger. I like the Roger aspect of uh, of that particular champagne, and it also it resonates too because last week uh, Simon was talking uh, to Andrew Roberts about Churchill. So uh, it's amazing how things come back. So. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, instead of charging for this webinar, I'd invite you to support the RSM in our charitable work, which is supporting especially these young doctors in their PPE suits, dealing at the front line, putting their lives on the line to look after their patients now. All donations that you make to the RSM will go directly to support them with well-being sessions that we're talking about this very afternoon. Um, so please do make a donation and please do come back next week uh, where Simon, uh, Sir Simon, will be talking to uh, 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 Sir John Scarlett. Um, and uh, every Wednesday from now on uh, until this crisis is over, we'll, we'll be putting uh, together. But maybe we won't have anybody ever as charming as the, the amazing Jane McQuitty again. So good evening, everybody. Uh, a glass of red or a glass of champagne to you all. Farewell from the Royal Society of Medicine and thank you again, Jane.